This is World War II, Lesson 2. Let's get ready to rumble. And if I haven't explained it before, I'm going to explain it now. Those three dots are dots of impending doom. They mean dun, dun, dun. So therefore, it's lesson two. Let's get ready to rumble. Dun, dun, dun. Impending doom. Dots of doom. So Stalin, remember Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, communist Soviet Union, dictator of the Soviet Union, believed that the Western powers, by Western powers, we mean um, the Western European nations and the United States. So we're talking about uh, not only us, the United States, but Britain um, and France as well. He doesn't believe for a second that they're ever going to actually stand up to Adolf Hitler. Uh, they seem too willing to appease him. Um, and uh, so this drives Joseph Stalin to cut a deal. And he signs something called the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. And the point of this was, well, <laughs> it's actually the Soviets and the Nazis kind of using each other um, trying to buy time so they can be militarily ready to actually go to war. Now, the Western nations of, you know, Britain, France, United States are losing their mind. Um, they can't believe that this is actually happening. Uh, and you can see there's the, uh, the agreement. Von Ribbentrop is uh, signing the agreement with uh, Joseph Stalin behind him to the right. And the guy next to Stalin on the left is a guy you might have heard of, or at least his cocktail. Um, that is Molotov. He was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. Um, and if you've ever heard of a Molotov cocktail, um, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. But uh, Molotov cocktails are named after him. He looks like a, like a math professor, but in the end, he was kind of brutal. So this is a... Um, Herbert Block cartoon. Um, Herbert Block is one of my favorite political cartoonists. Um, and if I haven't used a political cartoon of his before, uh, this is a good first one to use. Um, you can see he titled it Little Golding Locks Riding Hood. And we all know the, the uh, story of Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and this is, she's representing Poland in this case, Little Red Riding Hood. And uh, what she's just found is uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia getting all cuddly in, in, uh, in bed. So this is a uh, European cartoon uh, that I found um, that uh, is kind of a funny way of showing the control that Hitler has over the Soviet Union. Um, the bear, oh, let's get back to that, the bear traditionally represents the Soviet Union. It's usually how uh, the Russians, you know, Russians or the Soviets are represented by a bear. You can see Hitler looking, you know, like Hitler. Um, and uh, he has that bear so trained, so uh, dependent on him that that bear, though his natural instinct is to snap his jaw shut and, and, and bite his head, um, he won't do it. And, and Hitler doesn't seem too afraid of, of that bear, does he? So you can see in September of 1939, uh, in this um, German cartoon, this Nazi Germany cartoon, uh, how he they feel he's he is playing the Soviet Union um, and controlling them. There's another political cartoon. I love my political cartoons. Uh, there's uh, Hitler on the left uh, addressing Joseph Stalin on the right. Uh, the guy on the ground represents Poland, um, and uh, you can see them addressing each other. Not real. Not real friendly, but being friendly. Um, this was a friendship of convenience. Um, as he addresses him, you know, oh, the scum of the earth, I believe. Ah, the bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. They don't like each other, but they're but they're using each other right now so that they don't fight each other because neither one are really prepared to fight. All right, well, let's get into World War II. The moment that most people recognize as the beginning of World War II is actually uh, right in the beginning of September of 1939. Um, some historians will look back to uh, Asia in 1937 and 38, where uh, Japan and China are actually fighting. Um, but uh, most most of us 
tend to recognize this as the moment where uh, where World War II actually gets going. So if you remember, Germany has taken um, the Rhineland, they've taken Austria, they've taken Czechoslovakia, and basically the line in the sand was drawn at that point. The British the and the French basically said, listen, that's enough. You, you told us you were going to stop there. You're clearly getting ready to move on Poland. If you invade Poland, we're going to war. So Hitler needed a way. He needed a way to do this. So he, he's he's crazy. If you haven't figured out, Adolf Hitler is kind of crazy. Adolf Hitler um, set up a plot so that it would look like Poland actually attacked him. And then therefore, he could attack Poland in self-defense. By, so he comes up with a, a, a situation where some um, Nazi soldiers, German soldiers, disguised in Polish military uniforms, attacked a radio station on the border of uh, Germany and Poland, in Germany. So the, these fake Polish soldiers attack a, Polish, uh, a German radio station. And they take over, and they, and there's like fake blood, and and there's this whole scene. And uh, Hitler, now it's it's a radio station, not like a music radio station, like a military radio station, communication station. And uh, this is the, this is what he uses to then go in and attack Poland. In what is this? But let's just say it's a pretty savage uh, attack on Poland, considering all he's accusing them of is is uh, taking a radio station. But he rolled in with the, his tanks, these Panzer tanks, and uh, it was quick. He came in quick. Now, Poland wasn't exactly ready to stop this because, A, they weren't prepared for war because they didn't really do anything. They didn't attack a radio station. And, B, they don't have much of a military anyway. Uh, they have nothing that's really going to stop those tanks. As a matter of fact, this is an actual picture. Like this is real, of the Polish cavalry right before World War II. They're going to try to fight tanks with guys on horses <laughs> and like lances. This is not a fair fight. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we, we did find uh, some actual audio from this. Uh, luckily, they're speaking English for us. escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? Yeah, I stabbed a man in the heart. I saw that. Brick killed a guy. Did you throw a trident? Yeah, there were horses and a man on fire, and I killed a guy with a trident. Brick, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. You should find yourself a safe house or a relative close by. Lay low for a while, because you're probably wanted for murder. So that, thank God there was the actual audio footage just to show you how crazy things were. So as promised, Britain and France then uh, declared war on Germany. Now, just because you declare war on somebody doesn't mean you actually like are firing at them or hitting them with anything. Um, I mean, I, you can declare war on me, but until you actually walk up and slap me in the face, you know, it's just words. Um, and don't do that. Like, don't, don't slap. Never mind. Um, Britain and France declare war on Germany. So, in 1940, Hitler decides to strike at France, goes west, before France can be ready to actually fight. It, it takes a while from, you know, when somebody declares war is, you know, thinking about going to war, it takes a long time to mobilize your troops and get there, everybody trained and uniformed and, and uh, strategy. And like, this isn't just a thing that just pops up and happens. It takes a while to, uh, to actually, you know, even, even, even recently, I mean, um, you know, we famously got hit on 9-11, right? In, in uh, 01 or 02 and uh, 01, 9-11, 01. And uh, so that's September, right? And it wasn't until mid-October that we actually went after the guys who did it. It took us a month and a little bit, just to, well, just about a month, um, 
to uh, to get ready to go, to, to be prepared to fight with the kind of terrain we were going to be fighting, the kind of weapons, the kind of enemy, um, and to get everything organized and ready to roll. So this was, uh, this. it takes a while to get going. So he decides he's going to attack France before they can be ready. Now, this one may sound familiar. If you remember the Schlieffen plan of uh, World War One. this was kind of the plan, is to beat up France quick and then be ready to fight other places. So this time, he not only rolls in with the Panzer tanks. As a matter of fact, he, he, the tanks were going to be the second wave. The first wave, he, he releases something that's kind of a new weapon. He's actually going to use airplanes dropping bombs. Uh, it's called lightning warfare, uh, or this was his Luftwaffe. So, um, so the, he first attacks from the air and bombs, you know, the crap out of everything as best he can, and then he rolls the tanks in. And here come the tanks, the Panzer tanks. And so you can see it's a it's a similar idea to uh, the Schlieffen plan, where they're going to uh, avoid. Um, the, the mountain ranges and the wetlands and everything else that's in the way there, and they're going to come through Belgium. Now, um, for, Germany's in a much better situation here, and Belgium didn't have a lot of resources to slow them down like they did in, in World War I. Um, but uh, France is going to get run over pretty quick because uh, Germans are going to take, the, the Nazis are going to take over Paris. Um, and, and that's kind of old school warfare, right? The uh, idea that if you take the nation's capital, it's kind of like ripping out their heart. Um, it, 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 you destroy their will to fight. So you can see uh, he's actually, there's Hitler in the middle there actually posing for the camera in front of the uh, Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, there is actually video of him doing a jig in front of the Eiffel Tower. It's kind of hilarious. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's hard to find on YouTube. It's been there. It gets taken down every once in a while. But it, it, it's been up there before. You could find it. So uh, our buddy Herblock, once again, uh, just, you know, giving his opinion here with, through uh, the brilliance of his art. Um, and uh, this is his version of what peace would mean if we let Adolf Hitler keep doing what he's doing. This guy's taking over the world and he's going to impose peace under his terms. Well, Great Britain is still preparing for war, and they're trying to figure out how to, what to do here. And uh, they run into a problem, uh, a leadership issue. Neville Chamberlain uh, steps down. He's no longer the, uh, the leader of Great Britain. And a new guy ste steps up. His name is Winston Churchill. So you can see uh, Chamberlain resigns. Churchill's the new premier. Um, Churchill is the great example of a frumpy Brit. If you don't know what frumpy means, uh, I'm about to show you. So there's a uh, very frumpy Winston Churchill, an English boy if there ever was one, uh, English man, a frumpy British man uh, in his uh, I'm a little teapot pose there. So basically, again, this is not a world history class. Um, it's a, it's a, an American history class, but we do need to cover just the basics here. So Britain now has to stand alone against Adolf Hitler. And there's going to be a fight. Um, this, the British Royal Air Force, the RAF, is going to stand up to Adolf Hitler. Hitler is only going to bomb from the air. He's not going to attack. I remember England is part of Great Britain, which is a, an island. Um, and uh, instead of trying to attack on the water, Hitler Hitler did learn some lessons from Napoleon. I mean, one of the things that brought Napoleon down was the idea that he tried to attack Britain on the water, and Britain is phenomenal on the water. They're the best on the water. They used to be the best on the water. In this particular situation, Hitler decides he's going to use his his lightning war and uh, and bomb from the air. So uh, Winston Churchill famously will motivate the Royal Air Force to uh, to to fight. Um, and the British people to uh, to continue living their lives and, and to help the cause and to do what they can to, to live to fight another day. And what it, in what is called the Battle of Britain, it, it, it's, it's a great win for the British. Um, eventually, Hitler, after months and months and months of, of this, I think it's like nine months of just constant bombing, 
um, and fighting with the Royal Air Force, he just stops. And, and nobody knows why he stops. And the next thing you know, he attacks in the other direction. He breaks up with the Soviet Union. He breaks this Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. On June 21st, 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union with something called Operation Barbarossa, in which uh, he has a line of, of tanks and, and military personnel in what would be the equivalent of a line of military from Scranton, Pennsylvania, all the way down to New Orleans, Louisiana, and moving across the United States. Huge, crazy line. Uh, well, this is the way he invades the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is like, bro, seriously? Like, what, what, what are you doing? Um, so you can see the cover of the New York Times here. Hitler begins his war on Russia with armies on march from the Arctic to the Black Sea. It is a crazy attack, Operation Barbarossa. But he has not finished off the British. He technically, again, this isn't a World War, you know, a World History class and a World War II course specifically. But he, he kind of gave up on finishing off the French too. So he's left the French and the British both live to fight another day. And now he's taking on his biggest military in 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 the biggest country in Europe, the Soviet Union. So um, there's an old saying, and, and, and you'll hear this in history classes beyond mine, but uh, it's, it's the saying goes, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Churchill and Stalin are British and the, and the Russians, the Soviets, are certainly not friends, but they share a common enemy. They both need Adolf Hitler to lose, and they're both fighting Adolf Hitler. So they team up. They start working together. The enemy of your enemy is your friend. And so they're going to put aside their differences of, of, of economics and government and, and everything else. Um, and they're going to work together. And you can see uh, Winston Churchill, his frumpy self on the left and Joseph Stalin on the right. So Hitler is now fighting the Soviet Union. He didn't finish off the French. He didn't finish off the British. He has pretty much control of everything else, including his alliances with with Spain and with Mussolini in Italy. Um, it's he has control of Europe right now. And then it happens on December seventh, nineteen forty one. Japan attacks the United States of America. They hit us at Pearl Harbor, which is in Hawaii. You can see it there, um, the Hawaiian Islands. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that Hawaii is not technically a state of the United States at this point. It won't be until the 1950s that that uh, Hawaii becomes a state. But, but it is a territory, and we do have a military base there. And you can see there's the naval base in Pearl Harbor. You get a better idea as to uh, you know what was normally there. There was a lot of we had a lot of ships there. A lot of soldiers, well, Navy, naval seamen stationed there. Um, this was our fleet in the Pacific Ocean. You can see the attack happens at 7.55 a.m. on December 7th, 1941. I believe it was a Sunday morning. Everybody was uh, still mostly sleeping. And then the attack begins. This is actually a picture from uh, one of the Japanese pilots who were coming in uh, on his attacking run. And you can see our ships are just lined up there. I mean, we're easy targets uh, because we did not see this coming. Smoke billowing out from uh, fires that are, as the ships are sinking, fuel is burning, lives are being lost. Uh, over 2,000 Americans are gonna die uh, in this attack. You see some of the uh, the damage after the attack there. Just to give you scale, like there's there's, there's two two uh, men down there at the bottom of the picture there. This is one of the more famous pictures of of the attack of Pearl Harbor. Uh, however, it's it's interesting because this is not a real picture. Um, this is so when the Japanese attacked the United States. 
in Pearl Harbor in our territory of Hawaii. Nobody thought to film it. So in order to show the American people what happened, President Roosevelt asked the Hollywood movie industry to kind of reenact it. So they actually made little models of, of the area and then uh, blew them up, filmed it, uh, made it look real. And, uh, and they made this like newsreel footage of the attack so that the American people could see this horrific thing that the Japanese have done because that inspires the revenge factor. Like if they've hit us, we got to get them back. So December 7th, 1941, the date that will forever live in infamy. Um, December 8th is the day that we declare war on Japan. And you can see President Roosevelt standing at the podium there, uh, speaking to uh, both houses of Congress, um, asking them for a declaration of war. Remember, it's the Congress that declares war, not the President of the United States. So he's asking for a declaration of war. For anybody who paid attention to uh, anything we talked about with Franklin Roosevelt earlier, um, this picture doesn't make a lot of sense to you because he's standing. Now, remember, he has polio and other medical problems, and, and really standing is not one of his things. He, like, it's not one of his skills at this point in, in his life. Um, but the media back then was, was very much in favor of making sure that our president looked strong and, and powerful and did not look weak in any way, shape, or form. They weren't looking to sink the president. They were looking to make sure that he looked good. Boy, if times changed, right? Um, so in this particular situation, Roosevelt is wearing these crazy braces all up his legs and to his back. Uh, they're basically holding him up. So he was actually at that podium to make the speech, and then everybody was brought in so that nobody could see or have that picture moment, um, you know, where, where he looks weak in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there he is signing the declaration of war and uh, that the Congress has voted on and uh, and we're ready to go. Um, this didn't need to happen necessarily. I and mean, we right now are declaring war on Japan. Uh, but since Japan and Germany are allies in this particular scenario, um, and again, there's a whole relationship there that started after World War One. Um, where Hitler was cutting deals with the Japanese. Um, Germany then declares war on the United States. So it's on. Like Donkey Kong. You see in the U.S. now at war with Germany and Italy. This is uh, December 12th, 1941. Now we're not actually going to be in Europe fighting anybody until June of 1944. So it's going to be about three, two and a half years till we get into Europe. Uh, our first uh, priority right now is the Japanese because they're the ones who got us. The problem is Japan is a series of islands long before you get to the mainland Japan. So it's going to take us a while to do what is called island hopping or uh, leapfrogging the islands through the Pacific and working our way toward mainland Japan. Um, and we're not going to show up in, in Europe for a while because um, well, we're going to let the Nazis and Soviets fight a while and let them both beat each other up for a bit. And uh, we're going to start to plan with our with what is left of France and the British uh, and, and try to figure out our best uh, move forward. So the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And we are now allies with the Soviet Union. And so FDR, if you remember what I said before, was he asked the Hollywood movie industry to make propaganda films about how um, the Japanese attacked us so the American people could see what happened. He's also going to ask the Hollywood industry, movie industry, to make films about how the communists aren't necessarily so bad um, so that the American people could understand why we are working with Uncle, he would call him Uncle Joe Stalin. Um, and the Soviet Union. This is, again, long before we find out that Joseph Stalin's a really bad guy. Um, he's, he, right now, he's just a communist, and we don't like communists because they bailed on us in World War I, and their economic system and their government system doesn't agree with ours in any manner. But right now, the bigger problem is the Nazis, and uh, so we are going to team up with the Soviets and Joe Stalin to uh, beat up the Nazis. So let's go. <laughs> 